I wanted to share with you today two projects. Um, some of you may have actually seen it before, um, so you know. Uh, but I, I think may, maybe others not. Uh, two projects that we embarked on um, on our own initiative, uh, just to you know immerse ourselves in what are the fundamental issues uh, and what we architects, planners, designers can bring to the table. It's a very very large issue. Can be very politicized. All that. Uh, but on the ground, they, uh, to us, it, it's, it really boils down to very simple things that needs to be understood and addressed. So um, we'll, I'll take you through these projects to see how um, you know, we can understand that. We, we all know Pakliling Flats is the icon of um, sort of public social housing. Um, we, um, you, you can go through this very quickly. These are people who live in the flats. Uh, I, I, in some of my um, my architects uh, back in a couple of years ago when they first started to demolish uh, some of the blocks went, went to the flats and you know, looked around one, wanted to understand more why this was happening uh, by that time of course it was already a done deal you know City Hall had already written it off signed it off for private development uh, privatised development but we just were curious you know it's something we grow up with we drive up and down past these flats all our lives um, and, and really, I, I, we started to look at the statistics, and it is a very large community who live there. Uh, there are, I'm not sure we went to that slide, there are actually 3,000 flats in these uh, seven blocks, 17 stories high and two more blocks lower rise. There are 3,000 families, and, and if you know the size of the families that actually live in one of these flats, there will be five, six people living in the flat. So you're talking about a community of about 15,000 people, all in a very tight 30-something acres in the middle of Kuala Lumpur. So um, what we were just dismayed at at that time, you know, as architects, um, that they appeared, the, whoever the authorities or powers that be, seemed to have made little effort to think about how, what else you could have done to it besides demolish. Um, so we really felt regret, we regretted that that was, thought, that was not even thought about um, because, uh, wait, let me go through, we can uh, share with you some of these slides because you will never see them again probably, the, the folks who live there. I gathered a few photographer friends and they've done wonderful portraits and we did, uh, we also did um, little surveys of when they came to live at the flats, all that, you know, we talked to them. They're young people, they're old people, the oldest people came in 1969. Uh, the flats actually were finished in April 1969, just before the May 1969 crisis. So a lot of families who felt, you know, uncomfortable in their neighbourhoods actually went to seek refuge in these flats. Those were the first communities that lived there. And that came out in the stories that we heard from the people that we met during those Sundays, that when we'll go there, you know, after we finish all our other work, then we go Sunday mornings and, and wander around there. Um, and, and we started to understand the life uh, within these so-called uh, really, um, you know, most of it look at uh, Perkeling as real urban blight, like, you know, the politicians don't like the clothes hanging out there. I don't know why. And because of that, um, because of the, the, the balconies with clothes hanging there, you know, the government actually made a policy that all balconies must face inwards. That's why all new public housing now, the balconies face inwards, because they don't really care whether you've got you know, air and sun, they just don't want it to look like your laundry's hanging out by the street side. So, you know, we really question what, you know, what drives public policy and thinking, you know, uh, and that's, that's some of the things that we do. I mean, like, of course, as I always say, you know, we go to Venice and we're like, oh, how, how romantic that, you know, clothes are hanging, but here, no, no. So anyway, uh, Pakling Flats, when it was built, um, was really considered state of the art because it was one of the first high-rise prefab housing. You know, today we go back again and say, oh, we want to do industrial, you know, BIM and whatnots and IBS, but actually they did it already and it's very high density. I can understand if we think that it's uh, low density and we need to reclaim and create, put more density in it, put more homes, but it's actually extremely high density, as mentioned, you know, 3,000 families in that area. Okay. Um, so this is it, 1969, when it was built by the uh, Public Works Department, uh, 2,969 flats. Um, we, uh, we, you know, they have so little drawings left of it. So my guys, we sort of uh, did some measured drawings of it. These are the seven blocks, uh, and we counted. And um, 
can move on. We'll go through very quickly. Don't want to take too much time. So as mentioned, 3,000 flats, 3,000 families, 15,000 and above residents on in that flat. Okay, and um, I re my my first encounter on the flats was with the curry puff boy. You know, he really told me the lesson of what you know life is there because you know the pickling flats they are long and narrow and have a long and narrow air well, hardly four meters wide. That that four meters is like 12 feet wide. That's the width of your room, you know, and that's a common space shared by 17 stories of families, um, four meters wide. And winding around it are these corridors, these dark corridors. And this was his, his city where he went around. Every morning, his mom will make curry puffs and some sort of fried pisang thing. And, um, and he'll go around. He'll start from the top, take the lift to the top, and he'll go around selling his... But it was like, a, you know, its own little city, and he, that, those were his streets, and he went around. We actually got our breakfast from him, you know, after a while when we got to know that he, he was doing his rounds. So there, there is life in there, however blighted it may seem from outside. Um, and uh, I didn't put in the pictures. They, they have their own market. They have their own huge uh, laundry, laundromat thing. Uh, I have pictures, actually. But anyway, they live in these units, which are only 386 square foot. The living and dining room together is 10 feet by 14 feet, 10 by 13. And they have a balcony, the, one, the balcony facing outside. And they're all one-bedroom flats, a bedroom of 10 feet by 10 feet. This is how compact it is, and many families live there. You know, the living room would at night become another bedroom for, for the kids. You know, the mattresses will roll out, and there, there you are, that's the second bedroom. You can see um, the next slide. Here's how a typical bedroom, uh, a living room looks like, you know. They, they still have pride in their home. Everything is so neat and clean, but that's, that's their home with very little furniture, so it's easy to roll out those mattresses at night. And uh, that's a, a bedroom. So this is how it is. That's the living, that's the bedroom. Very, very compact, very small kitchen, and one bathroom. So, well, this one was just, you know, as I said, at the time it was just already a done deal. So we just did some studies of how we thought uh, it could be recycled rather than demolished. Okay, um, so the, the, the basic problem we felt was that the, the air wells were so narrow and there was no air, no ventilation. The air was very still, it made people depressed. There were so many people who committed suicide, you know. All the residents that are there, there, who and who had, had landed there, there were so many. Every year, a few people will just jump because all of it was dark and depressing. So we felt, you know, um, so we, we need to fix that part then, you know. So that's what we envisioned, that... Um, that one, what we, if we were to rehabilitate the flats, we will just open it up, take out some of these units. The technology is with us to be able to do that, to partially support the, what we take out and then reinstate and create these open areas to bring light and ventilation, uh, breezes, whatever, into, into the courtyards. And then, you know, it can still sustain a whole community. That's what we thought. So there are just some visuals of our, you know, little study, um, of various ways that we can uh, open up and make life in the flats a lot more comfortable for people and therefore you know they're able then to retain to retain their homes and not be relocated um, to wherever you know some of them were relocated to Bukit Jalil, some to Stapa. Um, I, I do know people, our, t our own tea lady, when our office was in Jalan Ipo, used to actually live in the flats. She used to tell me, oh, my flat's so nice. I opened the window at night, no mosquito, no breeze, uh, I mean, no, no air con. And it, she said it feels like air con and she opens her window at night. But when, when the flats was demolished, she had to move to Bukit Jalil and she couldn't work for us anymore. So, so she just stayed at home after that. So, you know, like, this is what I mean, that when you move low-cost housing out of the city, you also cripple the work population. They, they are supporting, you know, the entire city working population at various levels. And she simply couldn't afford to take the LRT and the bus, spend two hours in the morning to get in, as well as pay for that, that transport to get in. So anyway, this was just hypothetical, you know, just for fun, when, as if we don't have enough things to do, uh, you know, doing our other expensive luxury apartments in KLCC. Um, so, uh, okay, so that's uh, how we could have done, because we saw this sort of public commitment in other cities. If we can move, um, we can go faster. We've got quite. So anyway, it's all gone. I think the last two blocks are now being 
blocked. I, I'm not sure what's coming up, you know, it's all very secretive. If you Google and w go into the web, you can't find anything. And uh, this is a very old original scheme. This was a scheme on which DBKL found the merit, you know, found enough merit to trust the developer to redevelop the site. So this is the Taman Sari scheme. I think since then nothing has happened and now everybody's jostling for this huge parcel of land in the middle of the city. But this one is all five-star hotels, luxury apartments, etc. Sh uh, shopping mall. Um, it's not very far from the river. You know, the uh, part of the Gombang of Sungai Busu is actually just around the corner from there. It will be some other version of this lah, that we can expect lah, for sure. Uh, but there's no indication that you know, the original residents will be, have the opportunity to be relocated here. I think today it's a bit better uh, when they relocate housing. They try to keep them closer to the neighbourhood. But unfortunately, with the Pagliling Flats, the, the community of, fifth, uh, you know, 15 over 1,000, 3,000 families that lived together since 1960s were just, what I said, uh, relocated. Not just relocated, but dislocated totally. So as I said, why is it in other, in other cities, um, there seems, you know, better initiatives to, to deal with public housing. Most, many of us may have seen this 50-storey towers with this public park on top. This is in Singapore, just finished in 2009. Look at that. You can, they actually charge you. Like, you have to pay 10 sing to go up to use the public park, but it's open. You just have to pay 10 sing. At the, no, no, sorry, one sing. 10 sing is, is uh, the other one, the, the one on the sands, right? This, you just have to pay a token amount to go up if you're not a resident, but there are about 1,848 units. Um, and it's not just another big glamorous project, it is a redevelopment undertaken by the Urban Redevelopment Authority in Singapore. There actually is one and remains one in Singapore. Uh, I'm not sure whether we do have one here anymore. But they, you know, back in the 60s, they also had, this is the same set of uh, flats that stood on the site of the, this, this, you know, very, uh, you know, futuristic looking bunch of apartments here. And the city the, you know, had the commitment to rebuild so that you know, public housing, affordable housing, is still retained in the city. I think that is um, you know, something that we've, you know, would be good for us to look at. And even in other great cities like London, where the real estate values are so high, Nobody touches the council housing from the 60s, no matter how ugly they will claim it is. You know, they'll say, oh, the raw concrete, you know, the post-war stuff, and how depressing. But no, 17% of UK households still live in council flats in the cities. In, you know, there are about 100 over of these uh, council estates. And also, they also have council homes, which are, you know, more on the outlying suburbs and uh, rural areas. So, and, and social housing stock, 55% is still owned by local authorities. Even though, of course, there's an involvement, they, they allow people now to buy since the early 80s, I think they have legislation to allow them to buy. Um, but you will see that it is not easy for these folks to buy. So I think the question that we wanted to bring up is that it's not just about the technical issues. There must certainly, it seems to us, that there must be a will and a commitment to keep low income, affordable, whatever, you know, new PC words you want to call them, housing within the city and not throw them far out for some of the reasons I've hopefully, you know, shared with you today.